Hello. Еще раз добрый день, уважаемые участники. Once again, hello, colleagues. We've launched our live broadcast. My name is Igor Pavlovsky. I'm director of the Arctic Development Project Office. I will give some opening remarks, and then I will uh, uh, give the floor to Pavel Divyatkin. He will be our moderator today. Uh, we had plans to have this session of roundtable discussions last year. We want to discuss the Arctic Council and Russia's involvement in the Arctic Council, considering that Russia is chairing the Arctic Council for the next two years. Of course, the political situation has changed dramatically, but we still decided to have these roundtables notwithstanding to consider how Russia could work with other nations in the Arctic region, especially since we've always been saying that the Arctic region is uh, an area where nations tend to be more pragmatic, less political, less <clears throat> insisting on their political views, their viewpoints, and it worked quite well up until this point. So let's uh, have a discussion. Let's see whether nations can still work together in the Arctic, considering how important this region is. First, I would like to give the floor to Nikolai Korchinov, ambassador at large of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Korchinov, uh, so what do you think about this new reality, new normal? Thank you very much. Hello, friends. I want to ask you whether interpretation is working. I can speak in both languages if interpretation doesn't work. So what do you suggest? We do have simultaneous interpretation. All right, great. First of all, I would like to say that the Russian Federation considers the Arctic Council as a format that uses Arctic cooperation on a broad range of issues, environment protection, science, early warning, climate change, adaptation, uh, biodiversity, uh, indigenous people of the Arctic, collective approaches, etc., etc. And we hope that the Arctic Council can uh, help the nations to manage this part of the world in a responsible manner. Up until recently, the Arctic Council was uh, quite effective as a format, helping to identify uh, key problems and find solutions on the matters of what we call soft security. The Russian Federation has always been committed to the Arctic Council and to cooperation in the Arctic Council. But at the same time, Russia has always maintained that there are many different formats and methods for securing its interest in the Arctic territories. What matters to us is uh, the practical effect of the efforts we make. For example, if we see that the Arctic Council is no longer an effective format, if the Arctic Council is no longer able to help us achieve our national interests, our national goals, 
as presented in the Russian Arctic Development Strategy 2030, uh, we will have to reevaluate our situation and uh, reconsider whether it makes sense for us to continue working in this format. We often talk about the future of the Arctic Council these days, but it is actually up to us. It is up to the member states. It's in our hands. What do we want to achieve? What are we trying to do? How are we going to operate in the Arctic area? Let me remind you. Many security experts have repeatedly pointed out the uh, risk of uh, security overspill. If there is a dispute or a conflict or some kind of event that is not part of the Arctic area, but it has this spillover effect, it can damage the situation in the Arctic as well. And this is exactly what happened today. For 25 years, we have never had such an instance, but now we do have such a situation on our hands. And many, many member nations of the Arctic Council have been involved in various military campaigns all over the world during this time. Yet nothing of the sort ever happened before. The current situation in the Arctic Council is uh, deplorable, of course. Why? First of all, the work on the numerous uh, instructions that ministers gave in the last meeting in Reykjavik on May 20th, this work has stopped now. Our nations have their uh, geo strategic plans. We adopted a strategic plan for the Arctic Council, but now, now the prospect of uh, implementing the strategic plan adopted in Reykjavik looks very obscure. We have some projects where only part of countries are involved in, other countries are not involved in those projects. The Russian Federation came up with certain initiatives and certain projects based on our interests, of course. And now many of those projects, those projects were intended to improve the well-being of uh, the indigenous peoples, etc., etc. Now we had to move those projects to the national level. Of course, later on, other countries could also join this work. Non-Arctic countries. Let me uh, stress one point, though. These projects are open for members of the indigenous peoples of other Arctic nations. We don't want to be exclusive here. We would like to avoid having a situation where the indigenous people of the Arctic are held hostages of uh, some preposterous decisions by certain nations. We don't want their uh, well-being to be jeopardized. Uh, we don't want to create any hindrances to this work to improving the well-being of the indigenous peoples. And uh, my last point. Suspending contacts, uh, contacts, terminating contacts, it's easy, but we know from experience that relaunching communications, relaunching the process is always much more difficult because you lose valuable time. You have to rebuild trust between people. You have people going out and new people coming in because uh, members of our working groups represent their nations, right? They represent their Arctic nations. It takes a lot of time 
to win trust, to establish relations, relations uh, to get to know each other, to figure out which expert has what skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if you ask me about the future of the Arctic Council, I don't have a ready-made answer for you. I'm just trying to be very cautious here in my uh, assessment of the current situation. First of all, I'm I want to be as careful as possible with my uh, predictions. I don't want to make any predictions because the situation is uh, very unpredictable. We can only say certain things based on common sense. I can only say that we remain open to cooperation with all uh, government agencies who share our approaches and uh, who want to see the Arctic developing in a sustainable manner. Well, these are my brief comments, my opening remarks about the current situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me give the floor to Pavel Dziviatkin now. Pavel, now you're the boss. Thank you very much, Igor Pavlovsky and Ambassador Korchunov uh, for your opening remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pavel Dyvyatkin. I'm a researcher at the Arctic Institute, a think tank based in Washington, D.C., and it's my honor to moderate this discussion on the Arctic Council and scenarios for the future of the International Forum. First, I would like to start by noting that the Arctic Council stands as a paragon of constructive cold, uh, post-Cold War cooperation and diplomacy. The success of the Arctic Council as a venue for solutions to Arctic environmental and development issues has led to effective diplomacy in the form of numerous multilaterally negotiated agreements on marine pollution, search and rescue, and international scientific cooperation. However, it has gone through diplomatic hangups and in 2019, especially US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo infamously tongue lashed China and Russia at the Arctic Ministerial Meeting in Finland and refused to sign the joint declaration due to its mention of climate change, though some may say the refusal had more to do with the US's competitive relations with China and Russia. Today, we face an even more dire situation following the major deterioration in West Russia relations over the conflict in Ukraine. Seven of the eight Arctic states criticized Russia's military actions in Ukraine and called for a suspension of activities. And in February of this year, former Secretary of State John Kerry, now serving as Biden's climate change envoy, expressed hope that President Putin would stay on track in the fight against climate change. So there may still be some room for crucial climate related cooperation, but this is unclear as there are now discussions on continuing the work of the Arctic Council without Russia, even during Russia's Arctic Council chairmanship. So today we're joined by esteemed, by esteemed experts from China, India, Finland, and Russia to discuss such issues of building trust, security, and mutually beneficial forms of cooperation in the Arctic. Uh, each speaker will have 15 minutes to present, and then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. And you're welcome to type your question into the uh, this is the first uh, of a series of seminars hosted by the Gorchakov Fund and the Project Office for Arctic Development. The next session will be on August 10th, which will focus on science cooperation in the Arctic. So I'll first start by introducing all of our speakers and then hand the floor over to our first presenter. We've already heard um, our opening our, um, our remarks from Nikolai Korchunov, the ambassador at large of the Russian Foreign Ministry and the chairman of the Arctic Council's Committee of Senior Officials. Uh, the following speaker will, uh, will be Nikolai Doronin, who is the chairman of the management board of the Project Office for Arctic Development in Russia. Then will be Professor Lassi Heinenen, who is the professor of Arctic politics in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Lapland in Finland. He's also the editor of the Arctic Yearbook, and the theme of the 2022 edition of the Arctic Yearbook is the Russian Arctic, Economics, Politics, and Peoples. Then we will hear from Professor Yang Cheng, professor at Shanghai International Studies University and deputy director of the Shanghai Academy of Global Governance and International Regional Studies. And then we will hear from Professor K. M. Sethi, senior fellow at the Indian Council of Social Science Research, 
director of the Inter-University Center for Social Science Research and Extension, and academic advisor to the International Center for Polar Studies at the Mahatma Gandhi University in Kerala, India. Nikolai Duranin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pavel. I think simultaneous interpretation is working, so I can speak in Russian. Ambassador Korchinov described in detail the current situation that we're in uh, geopolitically and uh, intergovernmentally. What I would like to focus on is uh, communications between experts, researchers, because currently communications are at a pretty low level because we are all part and parcel of uh, current political relationships between our countries. And this naturally affects our current processes, which used to work quite well in the past. We did have international cooperation between experts, between universities, but currently uh, these contacts are at a pretty low level. I'm currently in Arhangelsk, where we have an event of the Arctic Council chaired by Russia. There is a conference on microplastics pollution in the Arctic. It's an important subject. It's highly relevant, considering that Arctic seas, especially in the Russian zone, are highly uh, polluted because of transatlantic traffic. There is a lot of uh, pollution coming from Mexico going through Europe, through the Norwegian Sea, and then eventually ending up in the Barents Sea near Russian shores. And we don't have necessary technology to uh, stop these currents, stop this flow. But at the same time, we do need to do something about microplastic, this kind of pollution. And this can only be done through international cooperation. There is no other way uh, as far as Russia's contribution is concerned. Of course, we uh, are also thinking about Siberian rivers, how we can reduce pollution coming from Siberian rivers. But according to our research, uh, you can't really compare these numbers. What we have, uh, the, the pollution that comes from transatlantic flows, uh, these, these are hundreds and thousands, whereas pollution coming from Russian rivers is uh, 10 times or hundreds of times smaller amounts compared to that. So even if Russia reduces its uh, pollution to zero, I mean, pollution coming from our Siberian rivers, this won't change the situation very much because there will still be this huge flow of pollution coming in a natural way from northern america from western europe from northern europe i'm talking to the experts and to the scientists to the academics and they all say that there is almost no cooperation which used to be between different scientific organizations this is true for the barons cooperation which used to be quite widespread and uh, quite popular among the regions of the northwest of Russia and Finland, uh, Sweden and Norway. And um, again, the cool Arctic projects have been stopped, have been suspended, and no one understands how actually they can be prolonged or resumed in future. They just are put on hold. And this is also true for the Russia's participation in different climate uh, conferences uh, such as COP26, COP27, under the aegis of the United Nations, the experts who would go to Vienna, to New York, to Geneva, they note the fact that few experts are ready to speak on some professional topics that are all quite cautious because Actually, the image of an enemy uh, now is being created about Russia. But speaking about the Arctic, 
region. Here I would like to note several things. First of all, let me remind you that Russia has the biggest land border along the Arctic region and in essence it controls the Northern Sea route and therefore any development in the Arctic region is impossible without Russia. The position which does exist in the Arctic Council that all the countries do not want to cooperate with Russia is uh, totally futile. Just geographically, this is futile. This is not possible for geographic reasons. Secondly, Russia is uh, almost self-sufficient in all the areas related to the development of the Arctic territories. Quite recently, a strategy for the development of the Arctic territory until 2035 has been adopted as a strategic document. And it has been contributed to many by many ex experts. And this would embrace a lot of economic, social, and environmental issues. Because that certainly it would be quite difficult for Russia to deal without the technologies, which previously would be supplied by the Western countries. But the Russians are living in the Arctic lands, in the on the Arctic territories for more than 500 years, and then not going to leave. We can leave, we can accommodate, we can develop our territories this or that way. Let it be quite time consuming, but still we'll do that. And the th third thing is related to the humanitarian aspect. We speak a lot about indigenous peoples of the North or Aboriginal people of the North. We speak a lot about the rights the cultural, social and economic development, uh, that it is important to preserve their cultural heritage. Russia does a lot about that on its own. We have the biggest diversity of Aboriginal people who are living in the Arctic zone. There are more than 30 peoples living in the Arctic region, and we take an individual approach to everyone. We develop their culture, we support their minority languages. And for instance, we are supporting the set up the creation of uh, the written language of a uh, people which uh, has only 200 people 200 men within them just in order to preserve their unique culture the same is true of the unique use of land use of natural resources and uh, the traditional fishery the century old practices and rights which were lost abroad, but Russia preserves that, preserves that identity. I think that the suspension of the international cooperation would uh, damage, would uh, somehow be detrimental to the momentum that we have gained, but Russia may still support that development on its own. The motto, the slogan, which was chosen for the presidency of Russia in the Arctic Council, sustainable development for the purpose of for sustainable growth, I think just anticipated something because really we want to make sure that the Russian part of the Arctic region is comfortable and convenient for the people to leave. Again, the strategy for the development of the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation indicates its main purpose as uh, improving the living standards. That's quite uh, difficult, uh, quite a hard uh, objective, but Russia will not be complacent and will develop its remote regions. But international cooperation is very much uh, important. Altogether, acting together, we can do more. And uh, discovery of the Arctic region has always been an endeavor for the international teams. And uh, there were routes to, to be discovered from Europe to the North Pole and to the Russian teams would perish on that way. And there would be a lot of Swedes and a lot of uh, people from Norway. The Northern Sea route can become an international route. And now there are lots of options. The Northern Sea route now has been redirected to the cooperation with the uh, South East Asia, and uh, it's more accommodating the Russian domestic market, but still we have that uh, natural reserve and natural potential. 
I would call on you when the situation allows for that uh, to look soberly at that, especially when we speak about uh, the cooperation within the Arctic Council. And probably we will reset and revisit these issues. But I think there will be some changes uh, in uh, as, uh, what concerns our cooperation within the Arctic Council. We uh, there is a language of boycotts and uh, the language of sanctions that we hear, and that's very detrimental for the cooperation. But I still hope that the international cooperation would resume and uh, resurrect, because in terms of uh, discussions between the experts, that's very important in order to see the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nikolai, for your presentation. I'd like now to hand the floor over to Professor Lassi Heinenen. We can't hear you yet, Lassie. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's start. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for invitation to join this uh, roundtable discussion. I accepted the invitation uh, thinking that uh, as a researcher, as a member of the scientific community, you should be always ready to, to discuss and, and uh, be ready to, to change your ideas and thoughts. Even you might uh, disagree several issues, you uh, will easily find common ground. And uh, I remember that as a young researcher uh, in the end of the Cold War, that even to agree that you disagree was something. It was a starting point for, um, uh, for uh, discussion. And then uh, later on, you could find uh, uh, common interests and, and, and the, uh, the uh, discussion continued. Uh, as a member of the Arctic uh, research community, uh, I, I argue that uh, uh, Arctic cooperation has been very successful and it's man-made. It has been uh, really something what, uh, where, where not only states, governments have been active, but also other actors, societies, civil societies, people, uh, indigenous peoples, their organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations, even business. And, and that means that, that the Arctic cooperation is very valuable also uh, in the future. And uh, I, I really think that we should do everything in order to maintain that kind of uh, willingness to, to discuss with each other. And uh, as, a, as a further gener scenario for the Arctic uh, Council, I don't try to, to, to invent a, a wheel again. I would argue that there is this traditional wisdom that if there is political will to cooperate, then you cooperate. And if we think about why, what is the motivation for a political will today? Well, it's rather easy to say, it's uh, the uh, uh, environmental catastrophe and the climate, uh, climate crisis, which should be those motivations for us to act. And here, Arctic cooperation has been very uh, much uh, foreign to, to, to show that uh, the, the environment matters. And uh, to have, to start functional cooperation on environmental protection can be a starting point for much broader cooperation. And I mean, if we think about uh, functional cooperation, it's much more simple, it's much more flexible than to try to create some kind of coalitions or unions uh, or whatever, uh, where you have to make agreements about uh, guidelines and, and terms of references. 
if you are not ready to that, then you could be ready for functional cooperation on issues which matter, like, for example, uh, environmental protection. Well, uh, science is another uh, good example. I mean, scientific, scientific cooperation has been uh, flourishing in the Arctic. I mean, I have not, act, uh, I have not attended uh, national research projects for years because it's so natural to, to do uh, internationally and interregionally something what you uh, earlier you uh, did nationally. And now even globally. We launched something called the Global Arctic a few years ago, exactly thinking that it's not only that there are global impacts uh, affecting the Arctic region, but there are also implications uh, by the globalized Arctic, which are uh, hitting back and, and which are relevant for the rest of the, the globe, particularly the, the Northern Hemisphere. And, and I mean, the high geopolitical stability is one of those immaterial values which we have managed to create during uh, uh, three decades after the end of the Cold War. And I, 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 I'm not ready to give up that we, we will lose that uh, human capital because that is human capital, which is so valuable today. So the, the question is exactly how, how to maintain uh, these achievements and how, how, how first to maintain them and then how to develop them further. Uh, I, I know very well as an expert of international relations and international relations is exactly indicating that the, it is relations between states and other political entities, that there are cooperation as well, competition as well, conflicts. But uh, when competition and cooperation are very natural in the society uh, and also in the global uh, community, conflicts uh, and, and wars are not, because we can live without those. But of course, we have to work for that. And Again, uh, the Arctic has been and could be still very good example of that, what we have uh, managed to gain, doing things interregionally and globally, what earlier was done nationally. So, uh, and I, I, have, I have said this and I, I, I repeat it again, that, that Arctic cooperation can be good example in world politics, which uh, can be used also to be uh, applied uh, other parts of the globe and other, other cases. But of course, I mean, this, this means that, that uh, uh, Arctic states, great powers, they have to take it seriously, that we need this cooperation in order to be able to solve those uh, uh, real problems. I mean, uh, the, the the environmental catastrophe uh, and 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 uh, climate uh, crisis. I mean, younger generations they are expecting that they are ready for that. Then the question is that what about decision makers? Are they ready for that, or are they, uh, or is great power rivalry some kind of substitute? for climate change mitigation. Because the decisions are very hard. They are difficult, we know that. But we have to do them. So I, I would, um, as an expert of international re relation, uh, relations, I'm really disappointed that why the unified state system became a fundamental obstacle for an efficient management of the global environment because of political inability to, not to do the, the, the hard decisions, not to be able to work together when we need that. So states are failing to secure the everyday life of their citizens. 
And this is not good at all. But again, I mean, Arctic cooperation has showed that we can do practical cooperation if we wish, if we think that the benefits are so much more important that, than the cost. So this is my, my message, which I really hope and uh, uh, Arctic, the Arctic Yearbook is really platform, trying to be a platform where we can do this. We can have this discussion. Uh, the moderator mentioned that the team of this year's Arctic Yearbook is the Russian Arctic. And that was decided already end of the last year. We want to have that because the Russian Arctic is so important part of the Arctic region. And we have had already, we will have, and we, we uh, have reached already several really good uh, uh, manuscripts for the articles. So that is a modest example of that, what we can do and will do in the, in the, in the, in the future. But this is also example and courage to the others to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lassi, for your presentation about the importance and success of Arctic cooperation. I would like now to pass the floor to Professor Yang Cheng. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I will be speaking Russian. And uh, thank you so much, the organizer, for your invitation. I'm an expert on Russia, not on the Arctic region. But I attended many conferences on the Sino-Russian cooperation, and therefore I'm very much familiar with certain issues related to the Arctic. Therefore, I decided to express my personal opinion. I'd like to stress the fact that before becoming a professor, I worked for seven years for the foreign ministry in the Chinese embassy in Russia and do believe that uh, a good prerequisite for good cooperation between China and Russia is uh, an exact understanding and assessment of needs of each other. Therefore, I prefer to speak uh, in diplomatic terms and uh, avoid any empty talks. I would like to express some non-nonsense and constructive things. And on the other hand, uh, let me share some criticism. First of all, Russian-Chinese relations cannot be totally independent on the lasting Russian-Ukrainian conflict. The policy of China is similar to the situation when Crimea was uh, brought back to the Russian holding. And uh, certain sanctions were imposed against Russia then, but China insists that uh, this history is much more complicated. And uh, the NATO expansion to the east was uh, a reason enough for the special military operation. China's, China's uh, Russia policy can be described as friendly neutrality or active neutrality. We understand Russia's concerns, but considering that Ukraine is a sovereign independent state, uh, China cannot possibly side with Russia in this matter. Even if China maintains neutrality, the United States and its allies are taking uh, active sides in this matter. But uh, China is, uh, un unlike Russia, we are part of the international economic and uh, trade system. What the US and other Western countries are doing, we can, they can act crazy without considering various interests and uh, ties, etc. But China cannot possibly act in this manner. China has to carefully study possible reactions by the US and the West. So Russia may think that China's policy is that of a more like a wait and see approach. But I hope our Russian uh, friends can understand 
the reason for such a position. This is similar to what we did in 2014 when the conflict first started. Uh, unilateral sanctions may be adjusted later on. So uh, China has temporarily suspended some of its contacts with Russia, but they're certainly not over. Uh, our discussions regarding the Arctic Council have to take the military conflict between Russia and Ukraine and Western sanctions into account. One more important point related to the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine. I'm referring to Finland and Sweden joining NATO. This means that NATO brings even close, uh, comes even closer to Russia's borders. This will affect Russia's environment and this will affect the overall landscape, you might say, in the Arctic. I mean, once Sweden and Finland become NATO members, the Arctic will become an arena of uh, direct confrontation between NATO and Russia. I think Arctic issues will be further politicized and there will be more military confrontation between powers in the Arctic. I don't think this can be avoided. And uh, we have to consider all these factors when we ask ourselves how we can work with Russia in the Arctic. This is number two. Number three, uh, Russia distinguishes countries, uh, distinguishes between Arctic and non-Arctic countries. And this uh, limits China's status in the region because China seeks to play a bigger role in the Arctic. Uh, China describes itself as a neo-Arctic state. Uh, so these discussions about the legal status of the Arctic has always been the biggest obstacle to cooperation between Russia and China in the Arctic, even though we do have some uh good experience of working together there were some natural gas projects etc but uh, uh, these are mainly con informal contexts that do not have a structural political uh, framework i think what would help contacts between Russia and China in the Arctic is uh, some practical steps that need to be taken quickly. We need to establish clearly the legal status of the Arctic territories. China would not be able to work with Russia because uh, non-Arctic countries are being excluded from the dialogue. And now, because of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, Russia may end up more isolated. I'm not saying that China should enjoy the same rights as Russia and other Arctic countries, but at the same time, I think Russia should pay more attention to China's legitimate interests in the Arctic. Once this happens, we could uh, develop and institutionalize contacts between our countries in the Arctic. Now I'd like to say a few words about uh, the COVID-19 situation and its effects. I think Russia somewhat underestimates the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for example, we could cooperate in the area of um, tourism. The Chinese are very interested in uh, polar nights, uh, tourism, traveling to the Arctic 
areas, but currently there are numerous restrictions. For example, I haven't traveled abroad for three years now. It's uh, terrible. <laughs> In the past, I used to travel every year. Every year I would attend various international conferences, workshops. I would travel all over the world eight or ten times a year, all the time. But the last time was in January 2020. I traveled to Oxford. This was the last time I traveled outside China. Yeah, so, of course, COVID-19 had a major uh, negative effect, of course, on the situation, on cooperation. And uh, so far, China's policy has been very cautious in this respect. And um, unless China changes its approach to international travel, it would be hard to develop tourism and joint projects. Well, be that as it may, in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, the recent political and economic changes definitely present us with new opportunities for cooperation, including Arctic development. But I think uh, Russia needs stronger support from China uh, without politicizing Arctic issues. As far as China is concerned, I think China will pay attention to the interests of the indigenous people, environmental matters. Uh, this has already been mentioned by um, Ambassador Korchinov. I will stop here. In conclusion, I would just like to say that everything I said uh, is my personal position, not the official position of uh, the People's Republic of China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yang, for your presentation on Chinese cooperation with Russia and the Arctic. Uh, I'd like now to hand the floor to our final speaker, to Professor K.M. Siti. Thank you. I hope uh, I'm audible. Hello? Yes, we could hear you, Professor. Okay, Nikki. thank you. Thank you, moderator, uh, uh, Mr. Nikolai. Um, Ambassador uh, uh, Kochino, uh, moderator Pavel and other panelists. Uh, I'm glad to be on the panel of this uh, roundtable discussion on a very important topic today. Uh, I also share the concerns and perspectives put across by uh, His Excellency Ambassador Koshino uh, and other panelists. And I do hope that the, the Arctic Council will get activated without further delay. Uh, this is quite significant because uh, as environmental scientist Jessica once famously said, whatever happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there. Uh, though the Arctic looks far away, its impacts come closer to our front door anytime. Uh, a country like India has uh, obvious reasons to get involved in the Arctic affairs, though it is a newcomer in this area. India sees itself as, as part of the third pole, with the Himalayas uh, serving as the fortress of India uh, at geopolitical as well as ecosystem levels. That's why India, India's recently enunciated the Arctic policy holds relevance. Uh, as uh, you might be knowing, India notified its uh, Arctic policy uh, on 17th March this year after several months of uh, its draft uh, under discussion, at least since January 2021. Uh, when this uh, final notification came, uh, it also coincided with the several uh, events, twists and turns in international relations, 
when the major powers in the Arctic Council have taken an antagonistic position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, its current chairperson in the wake of the outbreak of the Ukrainian crisis. India knows that the developments under the emerging Arctic dispensation with the NATO reasserting its uh, role in the region have many repercussions. But as uh, uh, Professor Young said, as in the case of China, New Delhi is also cautious in its policy responses. Given the nature of India's relations with the vital stakeholders of the region, Understandably, India has been deeply involved, uh, interested in polar affairs and in the Arctic region as an active player as well as an observer in the Arctic Council. Uh, this has much broader dimensions in terms of its scientific engagement and collaborations with its partners. We have had already more than 12 expeditions besides uh, a permanent station, Himadri, in Arctic with the two observatory, uh, with the help of uh, Arctic states there. So that's why I would like to place it. I would place India's Arctic policy within, a, within its science diplomacy, given the range of its uh, techno scientific power and expertise. As you are aware, India is one of the top three countries in the world with a, with a higher position in scientific and uh, technical manpower. So India's Arctic policy is therefore grounded on a set of uh, goals, which include uh, strengthening India's scientific research and cooperation, climate and environmental protection, economic and human development, transportation and connectivity, governance and international cooperation, and national capacity building in the Arctic region. This is just the notified goals of uh, India's Arctic policy. So it says that the implementation of the policy uh, is planned in partnership with the different stakeholders, including academia, research community, business, and industry. So the policy basically aims to reinforce certain capabilities, na national capabilities and competencies in science and exploration, climate and environmental protection, and maritime and economic cooperation with the Arctic region. So it is envisaged as, as a broad policy ecosystem, which will help analyze, predict, and coordinate policy making on the economic, military, and strategic interests related to global shipping routes, energy security, and exploitation of mineral wealth. So India's RTPC has a section uh, for climate and environmental protection, which underlines how climate change is critical for the agroclimatic condition of countries like India, whose, uh, whose uh, food security is significantly dependent on the ecosystem stability. There are several areas of collaboration between polar studies and the study of the Himalayas. So expectedly, Arctic research will encourage the scientific community in analyzing the melting rates of the third pole, the Himalayan uh, glaciers. So we have the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research that itself uh, plays a significant role in this process of uh, rejuvenating research and uh, other activities. So in that sense, India's Arctic policy will promote comparative studies of the Arctic and the Himalayas. This is an area where even non-Arctic states have a vital stakes in the affairs of the Arctic developers. So India's Arctic policy from the point of view of economic opportunities, I would say that India's Arctic policy is envisaged to strengthen cooperation with the countries of the Arctic region under various uh, Arctic fora such as Arctic Council, uh, the importance of which has been stressed by all speakers, all panelists right now. In the emerging global situation, it will be a challenging task for India to increase its participation in the Arctic Council given the complex issues associated with the post-Ukrainian situation. Uh, India at the same time recognizes that the Arctic governance is very delicate in the contemporary geopolitical setting. And the region itself is uh, governed by several national laws, domestic laws, bilateral agreements, global treaties and conventions, uh, customary laws for the indigenous people and like that. 
So this is very important. India is one of the 13 nations holding observer status in the council, um, which, which deals with the issues of the Arctic governments and the indigenous people of the region. But the Ukraine war, as uh, rightly pointed out by the previous speaker, my Chinese counterpart, uh, the Ukraine war has had a, a direct impact on the geopolitics of the region. Of course, the eight member Arctic Council has five NATO members, Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Norway, and the United States. And in the wake of the Arctic uh, outbreak of the war, the seven of the eight Arctic states declared that they would pause the work of the council. And the agitated members, uh, they, they, even, they had even sought to halt all the working group meetings as they did in 2014. But Russia at the same time warned that any temporary freeze would inevitably lead to the accumulation of the risk and challenges to soft security in the region. This has been stressed by Ambassador uh, uh, Nikolai previously. Uh, obviously, India also faces a strategic dilemma uh, in the context of uh, Western sanctions on Russia, particularly uh, when it has several pending projects with the Moscow. For example, uh, an MOU was signed between the Nidhi Ayog, the successor of planning emission in India and the Ministry of Development of the Russian Far East and Arctic in 2000, uh, with a view to boosting the strategic partnership between India and Russia by strengthening cooperation in diverse areas, including trade, economics, and investment. Um, the agreement, the MOU, actually sought to prepare a program for the development of the Russian Far East and Arctic region for, for 2020 2025. Likewise, India and Russia were exploring the possibility of joint development of uh, hydrocarbons on the Arctic Shelf and uh, India and um, Russia's uh, Far East. And reports indicated that they were mainly focused on an energy cooperation and exports of Russian hydrocarbons to India were expanding with the two countries mutual interest in the implementation of the uh, projects underway. Uh, as I said there, over years, India's energy ties with Russia have shown growing significance. When President Vladimir Putin visited India a few years back, Russia and India pledged to collaborate on oil and gas projects in Russia, including Russia's Arctic Shelf and the shores of Pechora and Oxora Seas. And Russia was already supplying India with Arctic liquefied natural gas. Uh, while in 2017, Rosnet bought a 49% share of India's SR Oil Limited. So these deals were interpreted as part of a, a, quid, pro quo, uh, a quid pro quo in the context of India's uh, boldness in addressing the threat of US sanctions and a signature on Agreements on agreements to procure Russia's uh, air defense system, like for example, S 400. Uh, evidently, Moscow's enduring partnership with the New Delhi has made Russia inclined to seek Indian investment in the Arctic and other energy holdings. And India's Arctic policy has also underlined that the country has great interest in the realm of transportation and connectivity. Uh, 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 it, it, the, the Arctic policy says that India ranks third in the list of seafarer supplying nations, catering to almost 10% of uh, the global demand. So India's maritime human resources could contribute towards meeting the growing requirements of the Arctic in that sense. So India is expecting that ice-free conditions in the Arctic would facilitate the opening of new shipping routes and thereby lowering the cost and reshaping the global trade. And India also knows that Arctic is, uh, is, a, is a rich storehouse of resources where um, you have 13%, uh, almost 13% of the world's undiscovered oil and 30% of the undiscovered natural gas. So in the emerging scenario, India realized that uh, the Arctic has become geopolitically very sensitive with the major powers having vital stakes for security and commerce. We are actually caught between these two uh, problematics of security and problematics of commerce. So plausibly India's uh, Arctic policy is put across within a framework of uh, multilateralism and of course with a sense a sufficient understanding of the ground situation. 
Uh, New Delhi also knows that there is no alternative to a rule-based governance architecture in the Arctic. How to sustain this rule-based governance architecture is a real challenge for all stakeholders in the region, including India, as well as for their multilateral or multi-level engagements. So if the Arctic Council proceedings are put on rules and diplomacy will be for all regions and all countries of the world. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Siti, for your presentation on India's third poll policy in the Arctic. Uh, thank you very much to all the, all the speakers. There have been some excellent remarks on cooperation around microplastics, the success of scientific cooperation, Sino-Russian relations, India's third poll in the Arctic. Uh, I'd like to now start with uh, questions and answers. So please type your questions in the chat. We already have some coming in, uh, but I'd like to start with a question of my own that's addressed to the whole panel and to anyone who would like to comment. All the speakers mentioned the importance of considering the rights and interests of Arctic residents and indigenous peoples. So my question is about the role of indigenous people in Arctic governance. The Arctic Council is grounded in the spirit of inclusive collaboration and the participation of representatives of Arctic indigenous peoples. However, Arctic indigenous people were excluded from the decision of the seven of the eight Arctic states to suspend the work of the council in March 2022. And so following the escalation of the conflict in Ukraine, some indigenous groups such as the Russian section of the Sami Council said they could neither ignore nor remain silent about the situation in Ukraine and while not directly addressing who is right and who is wrong, concluded that there's no justification for military action. Furthermore, the Gwich'in Council International welcomed the pause of activities of the Arctic Council while expressing its, quote, grave concern for the people of Ukraine, particularly the indigenous peoples. And the Inuit Circumpolar Council expressed concern about the future of the Arctic Council, which is based on peaceful cooperation and mutual respect, and reaffirmed the Council's commitment to the Arctic remaining a zone of peace in the spirit of Mikhail Gorbachev's 1987 speech in Murmansk. And so after the Arctic Council moved forward on continuing activities without Russia, the spokesman of the Inuit Circumpolar Council said they were informed about the decision, but complained that they were not consulted. So my question is about the exclusion of initiatives in Arctic governance in the context of such security tensions and steep geopolitical disagreements. So uh, there was an excellent uh, question put forward by American professor Barry Scott Zellin in a, in a recent article for the Arctic Circle Journal, where he asked, how will the council reconcile the interests of indigenous peoples and modern states if it can't find a way to bridge the gaps in ideologies and governing philosophies separating the Arctic Seven from its circumpolar neighbor, Russia? So this question is for any, any speaker, the role of indigenous peoples um, representation and their interests in Arctic governance and whether or not uh, exclusion or inclusion exists. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I can I can start. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's an excellent uh, question, but uh, I I would like to remind you that 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 wouldn't be the first time when uh, Arctic Indigenous peoples so we are excluded when uh, the five coastal states of the Arctic Ocean had their meeting in Irulissat 2008. Uh, Arctic indigenous peoples were excluded in that meeting and they were not happy with, with that. Uh, and I understand that uh, uh, very well. And they are not happy at all the, the current situation when it's not the eight Arctic states plus indigenous peoples, because we have to remember the Arctic Council, when it was established, was very, uh, in, in, uh, was rather innovative, because it included not only uh, Arctic states, but also indigenous peoples uh, as uh, subnational actors in the structure. And of course, observers, where you can have also non-state actors. 
But I mean, uh, uh, their role in covenants, uh, when we think about covenants, not governing, has been very important. And like uh, they have created, it was Inuit Circular Council, something called resource uh, sovereignty, M meaning a little bit different what is state sovereignty, meaning that they have a right to uh, the resources or they should have a right for the resources. Uh, which belong to the, their their lands and waters. So so that is something which is very important when we think about the role of, of, of the environment in, 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 in how, how to how to get rid from this uh, current situation of uh, environmental uh, catastrophe. So uh, I don't know what what we could do here except to include them. I mean, uh, as, a, as a political scientist, even I have started to hear how much they know about many phenomena like climate, climate change. And that is called indigenous knowledge, which is very important. The current Western science cannot ignore anymore something called indigenous or traditional knowledge. So this is one more reason to say that no, they should be included all the time. Thank you very much, Lassi. Um, Ambassador Korchunov, um, I'd also like to give you the chance to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And certainly, I'm very much concerned when the decisions are taken without uh, consultations with the indigenous peoples. In my presentation, I already said that uh, the Aboriginal people, indigenous peoples, were taken hostage of the current situation in the Arctic Council. The situation between Sami organizations is uh, far from being good and uh, two organizations in Murmansk region has been excluded from the cooperation. We see some elements of fragmentation and split among the indigenous populations. When we were preparing for our chairmanship, for our presidency in the Arctic Council, we saw that the Arctic Council was a derivative of the public relations between the state actors. There is a problem of a split between the state actors, representatives of the public functions and working agencies of the state, and on the other hand, the people of the Arctic region. This is why for the first time, we appointed a special envoy on the indigenous peoples. And that's a period that the representatives of the indigenous peoples were not invited to this our meeting. Mr. Pagadai is an indigenous man himself and he is well known in all the Arctic nations. And that's a period that he was not invited because we have to resolve that disconnection and to invite the indigenous peoples to the very early stages of the decision-making of the programs and initiatives that we are discussing within the Arctic Council. This is number one, message number one. Second thing I would like to share is that the situation is not easy. We see that big pressure has been exercised on the indigenous peoples for political and other reasons. I remember a ministerial session and there was a presentation by Mr. Gauchinov, uh, a representative of uh, the International Inuit Council, who said that we are very much concerned about the militarization and escalation of tensions in the Arctic region. During the Russia's presidency and chairmanship, we started for the first time, it was total and precedent, we started discussing the rights of indigenous peoples. Two symposia were held dedicated to 
the protection of intellectual property rights of uh, indigenous peoples. And all the indigenous peoples were invited to these consultations. The Russian Federation initiated a project to preserve the historical, cultural, and linguistic heritage of the indigenous peoples. Why? Because we started celebrating a decade of uh, or 10 days of uh, minority indigenous languages in the United Nations. Within the Arctic Council, we called on preserving the minority languages as well. Uh, our appeal fell on the deaf ears, therefore we decided to implement that uh, at the national level, hoping that this situation would change for the better eventually, and that soon we will be able to cooperate all together. But all the Russian projects are open for all the indigenous states and nations. This is something I would like to stress, to underline. As far as I'm taking the mic, I would like to question by Robert regarding the channels of military communications and escalations. Well, in the course of our today's session, Yang Chang started speaking about the NATO expansion, that once Finland and Sweden are invited to the NATO, it would result in more escalation in that region. This is a viewpoint by our Chinese colleague, by our Chinese expert. Secondly, we see that the military activity becomes more uh, diverse in terms of other nations. The non-Arctic nation, the United Kingdom, now is adopting its Arctic military strategy, and uh, certainly we cannot ignore it. Will it somehow improve security in that region? I doubt very much. And certainly that situation causes a lot of concerns, and uh, these concerns are growing. The Arctic Council is dealing with the soft security issues, meaning that the Arctic Council identifies at early stages some problems and offers some solutions. For instance, as it used to be when we spoke about uh, mitigation of oil spills, search and rescue, uh, scientific operation and other things. So these are the soft security questions. Should anything happen? But now we see an unprecedented climate change. The temperature rise is totally unprecedented. We see wildfires in all the Arctic nations. The Russian Federation has prepared an interdepartmental mechanism for certain ministries to cooperate, and we cannot propose that initiative, and this is not our... We very diligently got prepared for that. We supported the indigenous peoples of the United States and Canada who made that proposition, who made that initiative, but now it's all is frozen. I'm not sure whether we can revisit it. We have to understand that if diplomacy doesn't work, then the guns would speak. Unfortunately, that's the history. The military diplomacy, does it work in the Arctic region? Do we have a dialogue among the experts? And uh, I just divert from the Arctic Council. I uh, also, uh, I'm an ambassador at large within the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So let me speak in that capacity. As far as the Arctic Council is not dealing with the hard security issues, this is not our mandate according to the Ottawa Declaration. But there are some concerns. And if we are not discussing these concerns, if our military experts do not meet on a regular basis, if uh, our military do not understand the maneuvers made by the other party, it would escalate the situation. The military 
intentions would be misunderstood and what would it result in, in something dire. Secondly, the potentials of non-Arctic states are growing, meaning that the non-Arctic nations are sending their troops to the Arctic region. The risks are high that a conflict may pop up. There is a potential for such a conflict. And uh, if any deconflicting is held, if a dialogue between the military experts uh, of the eight Arctic nations is held, that would be good, but these things are non-existent. I think that uh, the answer is obvious. So we don't have any such mechanism to escalate. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kornov, uh, um, for your answers to, uh, to both those questions. Thank you so much. Um, Nikolai Doronin, I'd like to hand the floor to you as well to, to answer your chance to answer the question about indigenous people's representation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Pavel. Let me share a couple of comments regarding the voice of the indigenous peoples. Really, today, Russia is uh, trying to listen to the indigenous peoples at all the levels. For instance, they invited, so they are being consulted with once any projects on the use of the territory where they are living is being discussed. For instance, some preliminary agreement is being obtained from the indigenous peoples, they invited for the public reviews, means that the economic projects, which are to be implemented in the Northern Territories would imply involvement, engagement of the indigenous peoples to that discussions. And we do hear their voices. And besides, many representatives of the indigenous peoples are in the executive agencies and bodies of the Russian Federation. Besides, we have several senators uh, of the indigenous people's origin, and they also stand up for the rights of these peoples in the parliament. Certainly, there are certain overreactions and certain mistakes. For instance, a conflict in the Sami community. For me, that's very strange to see that a person would leave his native country, would set up an organization abroad and would speak on behalf of all the indigenous peoples who are living in Russia, residing abroad. Unfortunately, there is such a political dressing there. But if we divert from politics, then the problems that do exist are common for all the indigenous peoples. This is about the access to healthcare, uh, lack of education, lack of transportation, importantly, uh, no preservation and maintenance of the traditional handicrafts and uh, customs. This is something that we have to discuss because the problems are common, whereas the solutions can be. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Uh, yes, Professor Siti. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, a very crucial question that uh, Pavel has raised. And I understand that there is uh, uh, an observer status uh, given to the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs and the Arctic Council which has been uh, an observer since 2002. Uh, I do not know the role that this particular NGO has been playing, international NGO has been playing in the Arctic Council with respect to looking after the interests of or the affairs of the indigenous people there. But still, whatever may be the role that it has been playing, uh, whether it can represent all the indigenous communities from different uh, uh, parts of this Arctic region, uh, my my feeling is that it is the primary responsibility of the uh, the respective states to look after them. I, I would say uh, an example from India. When we say that we we have in the Himalayan region, which, which we consider as the third pole from the point of view of uh, the larger uh, perspective of international ecosystem, uh, we have a large number of uh, indigenous communities in the Himalayan region. And um, we have heard stories of uh, news and reports about uh, these indigenous communities have been vitally affected by the mega development projects in the Himalayan region. 
I think uh, nobody else can look after these people other than the agency called the state itself. I think we have our voices being expressed from time to time in respect of uh, looking after the affairs of the indigenous, indigenous communities within this country. Likewise, I think we have all the respective states have a the primary responsibility in looking after the indigenous communities and the RT Council can play a, a larger role in terms of sensitizing these countries and peoples across this region. And that's my field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Siti. Um, I would like to also to give a chance for any other speakers to answer Professor Robert English's question, if you'd like to. Otherwise, we can move on to, we have another question in the chat from Yevgeny Tishenka from Baikalski Strategie. He asks, Saglasni li vi, što vlječenje čisla sudov na severnom morskom pudje vigodi ne prinesiot? Tarifi dla prohoda Rasi vesti ne može saglasna konvencije ON pa morskomu pravu. Kromje plati za vazmožnuju ledokolnuju provodku i naloga, so Lotsmanskova Svora Boše Ničovo ne smožem vzimat. Очень сложно, Павел, понять. А можно вывести на экран? Павел, could you please put this question on the screen? Because you read it, it was really hard to get it. Попробую помочь. Значит, согласно некой Евгении Тищенко, оно Балькайская стратегия. Согласны ли вы, что увеличение числа судов на северном? This is a question from Mr. Tishenko. Do you agree that increasing the number of vessels on the northern sea route does not provide any benefits? Does Russia will be able to introduce new tariffs according to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, when you say there will be no benefit, do you, do you mean benefit to whom? Probably he means Russia, because we said if the Northern Sea Route is used more actively as a transport corridor, I think he means this will not benefit Russia, because Russia won't be able to introduce any additional tariffs well i don't really know if we are talking about transit about russia making some money off the transit from asia to europe uh i think naturally this will benefit russia because uh this route is 40 percent shorter and as ice continues to melt and opportunities for navigation increases Obviously, some can make some money off this route. This is number one. Number two, this provides additional opportunities for export operations, both going from east to west and west to east and uh, moving uh, some uh, commodities, some minerals that you can mine in the Arctic region. Just a few months ago, uh, Novatec CEO Mr. Michelson said that in 2024, Novatec will be able to deliver its products, its gas, its uh, LNG. Ships will be able to uh, navigate all year round. And natural, this will benefit the economy of this region, of this company, Novatec, and this will benefit because uh, Russia will get more money in taxes. So I think this will have a positive effect. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Korchunov. Uh, I hope that answers um, Mr. Tushenko's question. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I think this is a good time to to close our discussion, I'd like to thank all the speakers, our audience questions, and thank you to the Gorchikov Fund and Project Office for Arctic Development for hosting us today. Uh, this is the first of a series of seminars, and the next session will be about science, the Arctic, on August 10th.
Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today and wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Спасибо. До свидания. Bye-bye.